Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to the Slack Public Lecture in our new digs. This is fabulous. Um, I apologize to all of you in the audience who haven't been able to get tickets for the past two years. But as you see, this is no longer a problem. So please watch for the announcements. We'll continue to have these every two months. And I hope you enjoy them. And by the way, just as a bonus, uh, Professor Jonathan Dorfan, who is the director before the, before the previous director of Slack, who's the person on whose initiative this public lecture series was started, is here in the audience today. So let's give him a round of applause. Well, today we're very lucky to have a lecture on dark matter, which I guess from the size of the crowd, everyone is interested in. And it will be given by Dr. Andrea Albert, who's a staff member here at the KIPAC, the Astrophysics Institute at Slack and Stanford. Andrea was an undergraduate at Rice University and went for a graduate study to Ohio State. And Ohio State is one of those universities that collaborates with Slack and many other people on the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Um, her advisor, actually I knew him when he was going from Ohio State to Fermilab to work on the top quark. But since then he doesn't go to Fermilab, he goes to space. <laughs> and so uh, Andrea was one of his students and uh, did searches for dark matter for her thesis and continues that study here as a staff member at Slack. So, Andrea, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Michael, for the wonderful introduction. Can you all hear me fine? Barely. Barely? Can we turn it up maybe a little bit on the mic? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is that better? <laughs> no problem. Uh, we're all getting used to our new digs here. So, uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research that I do here at Slack and that I did for my PhD thesis. And I hope to give you an idea of how I think about dark matter and the searches that we do for dark matter as a scientist. And I want to try to give you some of the intuitions that I've uh, come to develop over the years. And so, here we go. We're going to play Cosmic Clue, the dark matter mystery. Now, so before we play Clue, uh, the organizers did ask me to say a little bit about myself uh, and how I got into science. So you have to, it's fast, I promise. So a little bit about me. Um, you can maybe trace my, uh, my passion for understanding how things work back to eighth grade. This is a picture from the newspaper. There I am. Um, we built a roller coaster in eighth grade when we were learning about Newtonian mechanics. So I remember my, my part was during the lift, I talked about how we're gaining potential energy that's about to be converted to kinetic energy uh, as the roller coaster goes down the path. And in eighth grade, I had an amazing science teacher, Mary Hyde, who inspired me because she did these dazzling experiments, like uh, putting copper in fire, it turns the fire green, uh, making things explode, making things glow. And I wasn't just like dazzled by that. I mean, it was really pretty, but she told us that we know why this happens. And I wanted to know why that happened. Why is the fire green? And so then I went on and continued to love asking those questions and finding out the answers. So uh, I did lots of math and science in high school. And so then I went on to Rice, and at Rice, I got started with research as soon as possible. Uh, the classroom was not enough for me, and when I discovered the world of research where you're solving problems for the first time, there's no answer in the back of the book here, <laughs> right? So you can't just go look it up and be like, oh man, I hope I was right. Uh, you have to work with other people and like, convince yourself, is what you're seeing real or not real, and is your method sound? Uh, and I loved that. I loved that more than doing the problems that other people had already solved. And so I have some pictures. This is me freshman year at McDonald Observatory in Western Texas. Uh, and this is me right before senior year doing a summer internship at, at Fermilab. So as mentioned, I work on the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. This is a model uh, of Fermi. And it has launched in 2008. This is a picture of my PhD advisor. I unfortunately was not involved in the instrument during launch. He was. And so he got to go to launch, and he got what I consider to be the world's best selfie. There's Fermi, 
launching in the background, and this is his Facebook picture, so whenever I check him out on Facebook, I'm very jealous that Brian has this awesome picture of himself, but he deserves it, because uh, he helped build the trigger system on board. So Fermi, the main instrument is the LAT, or the Large Area Telescope, that's this top part. It's 1.8 meters by 1.8 meters, which to the Star Wars enthusiasts, you'll know is roughly the size of a Death Star thermal exhaust port, <laughs> or roughly the size of a Womp Rat, which I didn't realize how big they are. So Fermi has been uh, up orbiting since 2008. We've gone through over 40,000 orbits, go through uh, an orbit every hour and a half. And it's in a low Earth orbit, so it's just a mere 341 miles up. That's roughly the distance between San Jose and Los Angeles. So if you were just able to drive eight hours straight up in your car, you'd smack run into Fermi. And Fermi is an amazing instrument. It was a collaboration between NASA and the Department of Energy, along with other international collaborators, to get this thing up. And there's still an international collaboration today, which I'm a member of, that continues to monitor the instrument and control the data, which is all publicly available. But all right, so Fermi's awesome. And I, well, before I get into the science part, I wanted to take a moment to just say that there's no way I would be here without the support and encouragement of many, many people. So I'm saying this astrophysicist is brought to you by all of these people and more that I could not fit on this, on this slide. And um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that I wouldn't be here without this network of support and to say thank you. And uh, appropriately, the person who is pictured twice here is my husband, Dylan. So, and he's also here, of course. Uh, and so thank you very much to my friends and family and my mentors and my colleagues for all of their support. All right, let's get into the science. So dark matter. When you start to do dark matter research, what you're really asking is this fundamental question, what is the universe made of? And this is something that I think everyone's probably asked themselves at some point in their lives. And so we're going to use this beautiful picture from the quiver tree forest in Namibia to start to do an exercise to just try to answer this question. So say we're hanging out, enjoying this gorgeous scene, and we can start to identify some objects. So there's some trees. You know, starting off slow here. <laughs> some planets. So we have like Earth, the planet we live on. We can identify other planets in the sky. They move differently relative to point-like objects like stars. You can also see, since this is in the southern hemisphere, these fuzzy blobs, these are the large and small Magellanic clouds. These are actually small companion galaxies to the Milky Way galaxy. And so we've got other galaxies besides our own. And within the Milky Way galaxy, we can see along the plane, it's really dusty. Right? This is not point sources of light. The light's getting scattered around. There's a lot of dust and gas in the center here. And so, I want to ask you, how have we identified all of these objects? We've seen them, exactly. So we were able to look with our eyes and see the light that was emitted or reflected by these objects and say, there they are. And we have this model, the standard model of particle physics, which can break down all of those things that we can see and describe them at their most fundamental level. And so if we start with, say, a block of wood, we can zoom in deep, we see atoms, we know that atoms are made up of a nucleus and electrons, nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons, neutrons and protons are made up of things called quarks. All of these uh, particles interact with just four fundamental forces, electromagnetism, weak, strong, and gravity. And then there are 17, as far as we know, fundamental particles. It's a standard model of particle physics. It predicted the existence of a particle called the Higgs boson, and it was a huge accomplishment uh, for the physics community to go and discover that particle. So this is scientific method at work. We have a hypothesis, and we test that hypothesis, we discover this particle, and therefore it seems to be the standard model of particle physics is doing pretty good. Now, there are still some unanswered questions about the standard model of particle physics that I will not go into, uh, but you should look for some really exciting discoveries coming from the Large Hadron Collider within the next uh, months and even years. All right, so that's our standard model of particle physics, and it describes everything we can see very, very well. But what if there was an invisible component to the universe that we couldn't see? How would we see it? How would we even begin to become aware of its existence? And now we get to the first challenge, which is a movie. So we started with the standard model of particle physics, and that was the super zoomed in picture. We were looking at the atomic subatomic level. And in order to explore the 
a non-visible part of the universe, we need to zoom way out. So this is a movie I made. Um, oops, sorry about that. Don't hit the pointer. So this is a movie I made using a website called The Scale of the Universe, where you can use a little scroller and start to change the length scale that you want to look at. So we started with the atomic level, and you can see we're zooming out. The bottom right-hand corner tells you what the length scale we're at. And so we've got to keep going further, got to keep going further. We need to be able to look at the cosmic picture to get a better idea of what the universe is made out of. So we're going outside of our solar system, we're going past the neighbor stars, we got to keep on going. We're almost there, I promise. And we keep going past these nice nebula. They're beautiful. Wish we could stop to watch them. But we got to get all the way out to the galactic scale. So we have to zoom all the way out from the atomic scale and look at galaxies as a whole and our galaxy's place in the universe with all of the other galaxies. And when we do that, we realize that only 5% of the universe is described by the standard model of particle physics. So that's what I call atoms here. It's kind of shorthand. 95% of the universe is dark. It's uh, made of things that we cannot see, doesn't emit or reflect light. Uh, dark is really just the physicist's way of saying, yeah, it doesn't emit or reflect light. We're not very creative, so we went with dark. Um, we have dark energy is making up the majority of the mass and energy budget of the universe. And dark energy is what's causing the universe to expand faster and faster every day. And that's the most I'm going to say on dark energy. I hope that in the future there should be a public lecture on this, since there are many physicists here at SLAC also working on dark energy. Uh, and it's a very, very interesting topic. But I'm going to zoom into just the mass component of the universe. And 85%, roughly, of the mass in the universe is this stuff called dark matter. And only 15% uh, goes into atoms, normal stuff. So how do we know this, right? So I, I feel like I'm telling you a bit of a tall tale, right? It's like I'm, I'm asking you to trust me. 85% of the universe is dark matter. And so I'm going to try to go through some of the evidence we have for why we believe this. And we, it's really strong evidence at this point. I think it's, it's a pretty undisputed fact that we seem to need to have a lot more mass in the universe to explain what we're seeing. So what we know about the structure of galaxies is that they aren't just the beautiful pinwheel that we can see with our eyes. And in fact, galaxies reside within a giant cloud or halo of dark matter, which in this picture is blue. Dark matter is not actually blue. That would be emitting blue light. That would make it super easy to see. But just to give you an idea, it, 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 so the galaxy lives within this giant cloud, and the cloud extends out way past where all the stars uh, stop existing. And so how do we know this? Pretty much all the evidence we have for dark matter um, in forming these halos where galaxies live come from making measurements using gravity. And so I just wanted to take a brief moment to convince you that we understand gravity pretty well, and we can definitely infer things from it, even if we can't see them. And so, for example, say we have this deep well. We want to know the bottom of the well. We cannot see the bottom of the well, but we know that the acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 32 feet per second squared. This is a well-measured thing. And so if we drop this rock and we time it, and it takes one second to fall, we know the well is 16 feet deep. And even though we could not see the bottom of the well with our own eyes, we could still infer it using what we know about gravity here at Earth. So we're going to do something similar. And so now we'll zoom out a bit, and let's understand sort of the gravitational mechanics going on in our own solar system. So in our solar system, pretty much the majority of the gravity is coming from the sun. Big, massive object. Massive objects give you lots of gravity. And the sun's gravitational force is holding the planets in as they orbit around the sun. Now, as you get further away from an object, the gravitational force gets um, weaker. So you can see that the planets closer to the sun orbit around faster because the sun is holding onto them tighter. But if you go out to these outer planets, they're going much more slowly out where the gravitational force is less. So here is a system where we have a big central gravitational object 
And so all the gra here, the gravitational force in the solar system more or less is falling off as you move away. And so this is what we see in our solar system. Let's zoom out and see if we see the similar things in our galaxy. So when we look at the velocity of the stars orbiting around in spiral galaxies like our Milky Way, so we plot their speed as a function of their distance from the center of the galaxy, instead of seeing their speed slowly decrease like we saw for planets in the Milky Way, we see that their speeds actually increase and start to flatten off. And so that's telling you that the gravitational field holding the Milky Way together is different than the gravitational field holding our solar system together. It's not just a central point that everything is orbiting around. And actually, when you look into detailed measurements of the mo motion of these stars, it's telling you that you need this big spread out halo across the entire galaxy that it resides within to hold it together. And so if you want a one-liner about what is dark matter, dark matter is the gravitational glue that holds galaxies together. And without it, we would not have the galaxies that we see today in the universe. And so I'm going to show you an example of what happens if we didn't have dark matter. And so maybe if we could dim the lights just a bit for this video. Thank you very much. So I made this video using a game called Universe Sandbox 2. And so in this game, I'm able to create a spiral galaxy with a cloud of dark matter. That's the red dots. And since this is a game, they give me supreme cosmic power to just remove all dark matter, which is what I'm doing right now. Now you see the red dots have deleted. And so after we've removed the dark matter and we've well, watch how the stars evolve. We're going to speed up time because we're lazy and we have supreme cosmic power. You can see that the stars are moving away. This galaxy is falling apart. And it's falling apart in all three dimensions because it doesn't have that dark matter halo to hold it together. And you can see we get a little bit of a core there. There's a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. But you cannot get that giant, beautiful spiral structure that we saw at the beginning without a dark matter halo. And in fact, all of the structure that we see in the universe today requires dark matter to hold everything together and give us what we observe. And so the fact that galaxies don't look like this, they look like these beautiful spiral structures, that's our strongest evidence that dark matter exists. All right, so most of our evidence for dark matter comes from this gravitational inference. And so let's try to figure out what it is. And so to figure out what it is, when I was thinking about how to present this, I started realizing that I was asking the same sorts of questions that you ask to win the game Clue. So have you guys all heard of Clue or Cluedo, maybe? Anyone? OK, maybe you've seen the movie. It's great. Uh, back from with Tim, Tim Curry. All right, so with Clue, what's going on is this poor guy named Mr. Body was murdered. And to uh, win the game, you need to figure out who killed him, uh, where, and with what? And you need to get all three of those to win the game. You can't just get one. You need all three. And you don't, you can make guesses and you just slowly deduce what it isn't in order to figure out what it is. And so in the clue game, you're given this notepad of possible answers to these questions and you kind of start trying to cross them off one by one. And you cross them off by asking, is it Colonel Mustard in the hall with the knife? And so we're going to do the same kind of thing with dark matter. Because to solve the dark matter mystery, we're going to have to answer three questions. Who, how, and where. So let's start with the who. Well, what do we know about dark matter? So we're going to make a list of suspects. So what do we know? Well, we know it has to have a lot of mass, because it has to have a lot of gravity to hold galaxies together. Uh, we know it's associated. Known associates are galaxies and galaxy clusters. We also know it doesn't emit or reflect light. So I just made a, a list here. Uh, I decided that of the traditional clue uh, suspects, that Colonel Mustard was probably the most massive. That's a hypothesis, so, so he's, on our, he's on my list. Uh, also on this list is a massive compact halo objects, or machos. These are things like black holes or very compact dead stars that aren't going to emit light they're very dim, but they're still very massive, and they just get scattered across our galaxy. Or maybe it's something like a new particle, and this is just a new field of particles making up this giant cloud. So I have good news. We can already cross off one of our suspects. 
We can cross off Colonel Mustard. And the reason is because he's clearly reflecting light, right? He's reflecting this beautiful yellow light off of his jacket. That means he cannot be the dark matter. So we've already made some progress. And scientists today really focus on this last point here, this something new. And they, try, and they think the most promising suspect today is a new particle. And so this is one of, um, I think I have three science-y plots. This is from a recent review paper on dark matter. And this is just showing a variety of the different dark matter candidates that people talk about today. You can see this is a rather recent review that came out in 2015. And you can categorize these candidates by their mass, so heavier or lighter particles, and by their interaction probability, or for the experts in the crowd, their cross-section. And so a higher chance of, uh, of interacting, a lower chance of interacting. And the point I just wanted to make with this plot here is that there is a large variety of candidate particles that we've never discovered yet that the theorists have said, you know what? Maybe if the laws of physics do this special thing, then we get a neutralino. And so really, I just want you to take away from this that there is a lot of different particles here and that they have awesome names like Wimpzilla. That is an actual physical theory. People write papers about Wimpzillas. I think that's cool. And so I just want to make the point here, now that we're talking about um, how much the particle interacts, that dark matter does not interact very often. We know this. If it interacted with things or started bouncing off of things, we would have seen it. And so dark matter, you can think of as like a ninja. It's like a ninja ghost. So it's really elusive, and it just travels right through things. So really very difficult to detect. All right, so the prime suspect that most dark matter hunters are going after today is something called a weakly interacting massive particle, or a WIMP. The fact that WIMP is similar to macho is not a coincidence. Uh, but you can see, so massive, good, we need massive. And WIMPs are especially amazing uh, target to go for experimentally because the interaction rate that is predicted in many WIMP theories is just right to give us the universe that we see. So when uh, dark matter particles interact, or let's say they annihilate, they blow up, basically. They go away. So too much interaction, and the dark matter just goes away, and it can't stick around and give us the gravitational cloud that the galaxy forms in. So you, want, you don't want the dark matter to just annihilate away or decay away. You want it to stick around. And so if you interact too much, you're not going to have enough dark matter to hold everything together. If you interact too little, then you're going to have too much dark matter to form the universe that we're seeing today. And so the fact that WIMPs, this is often called the WIMP miracle, where you have a theory about how much the WIMPs interact that says, hey, in that theory, we predict 85% of the mass of the universe goes to this WIMP. And then you go back to your observations. You say, oh, I see 85% of the mass of the universe is dark matter. So you have this match between experiment and observation that makes this a very well-motivated hypothesis. And so that's why a lot of dark matter hunters are targeting it. So we're adding a card here to replace Colonel Mustard. I'm calling him Dr. Wimp. I have depicted him as a ninja because they, they are elusive. But you're going to see him show up in a couple more of these slides. Okay, so we're going to be looking after this Dr. Wimp guy. So what kind of signatures can we expect? How, how are we going to, how are we going to find him? How are we going to see him? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is something called direct detection. And this I kind of think of as like a stakeout. So these are experiments where you take a big tank of uh, material, you stick them underground, and you just wait. You just sit there, you get everything really quiet, and you wait for the dark matter to come by and whack into something. So, you, and that's, that's pretty much it. And then, of course, you have to be very careful to make sure everything's clean and quiet so that you don't fool yourself into seeing something when there isn't something to be seen. Now, these are incredibly challenging experiments because the amount of dark matter that's around us right now is quite low. And so I realize that with these numbers, maybe that's not quite obvious. But if we take a specific dark matter uh, model, which is a pretty standard uh, canonical model of about 100 GeV in mass, that means that the local density of dark matter is about one particle per liter. Now, that's really low. If you think back to high school when you learned about Avogadro's number, you know, that's kind of giving you an idea of how many particles, like air or water particles, are in a centimeter cubed. That was like 10 to the 23. 
So that's one with 23 num zeros after it. Now, if you imagine that the dark matter halo is at rest, and Earth and the solar system's whipping through around the galaxy, we're going through it about 450,000 miles an hour. So what that means is you have about a million dark matter particles going through your palm per second. And so, right, that, uh, sorry, I realize that sounds like that's super easy, right? But remember, the dark matter does not interact very often. So even though we have a million going through our palm per second, we have not seen it yet, and we have these big tanks that have been sitting there waiting for a detection, and they haven't seen it. And just for comparison, if you took your hand and stuck it out your window while you're going 30 miles an hour, you have one trillion trillion air molecules hitting your palm per second. So the one million, that's one with six zeros, one trillion trillion is a one with 24 zeros. And you wouldn't think that air is a very dense substance. So the one million per second really isn't all that much. So how, does these, how do these things work? Well, you take a big tank, like here, this is the uh, Large Underground Xenon Experiment, or LUX. This is uh, making use of an old gold mine down over in South Dakota. So they take this tank, they fill it up with liquid xenon, and then they just sit there and wait for dark matter to interact. Now, this is not how the experiment is performed. We don't have a physicist who's just always standing there <laughs> <laughs> looking for the experiment to, to make a signal. Uh, actually, when he's gone, this gets filled with water, which acts as a veto uh, for, for false signals. And so how does this happen? Well, we've got our dark matter particle. Remember Dr. Wimp? So dark matter is going to come in. This is the tank full of liquid xenon. So here is a xenon atom. Mr. or sorry, Dr. Wimp comes on in, and maybe we get lucky, and Dr. Wimp makes a mistake, and he scatters off of the xenon atom, like billiard balls, elastic scattering. And in doing so, you know, like the billiard balls, they hit, they make a sound. These guys are going to hit, scatter, and they're going to make a flash. And we're going to be able to detect that flash with our detector. So it's not only going to make a flash in light, but also a flash of uh, electrons. And then we're going to see those. And so we have experiments that are sitting down underground looking for this kind of a signal. Uh, like I said, nothing conclusive has been seen yet, but I really think we're just starting to scratch the surface. So look forward to uh, some, some more results from this stakeout. All right, another way. So how else are we going to look for, for Dr. Wimp? Well, we can sit and wait for him to make a mistake and interact with our xenon atom. Or we could say, well, we've got this giant collider that's smashing protons together over in Geneva. Let's see if when we smash the protons together, what happens if we get some dark matter? Could we look for that? And so we have something called the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and this is an ex a little movie showing where the beam of protons are going to collide. And then the, after, the effects of the collision are seen by these detectors. This is an example of a detector called CMS, uh, the compact muon solenoid. And so you can see that when those two things collide, all of their energy goes into creating new particles that are detected by the detector like CMS. And something that I want you to notice about this event is that everything is balanced along the beam axis. So that means these two things came on head on. Energy and momentum have to be conserved. That is, that is a pretty much a physics fact. We have no reason to believe that that's not true. And in many cases, we've had times where people say, wow, it looks like energy and momentum aren't conserved. That's kind of weird, so either those things aren't conserved or there's a new particle. And that's how the neutrino was hypothesized before it was discovered. So playing this game of saying, okay, energy has to be conserved and everything has to be symmetric is going to be really important for dark matter searches at the LHC. So this is an example of something called a die-jet event. Uh, it just means there's two jets. Jet is just a spew of particles. So you can see here that in our detector, we saw two spews back to back with equal energy. So energy is conserved. Great, good, everything's, uh, everything's going as we expect. Now remember, dark matter is a ghost ninja. So dark matter is not gonna interact in the detector, so a way a dark matter event would look is a monojet or a single jet that's not balanced. And so you'd be able to infer that there was a particle here because you know energy and momentum have to be conserved. Now, this is a tricky search because there are actually some other particles, um, Z bosons that decay neutrinos, you don't need to know the details there, but there are particles we know about who are also kind of ghost ninja-like. 
We know they're not the dark matter. So we can see this every once in a while. We just have to make sure we're not fooled. We know how often this is going to happen. And so if we start to see monojet events at a higher rate than we expect, then that's going to tell us that there might be something new like dark matter. All right, so we could create dark matter. Or, and we talked about dark matter scattering off of a xenon atom, what if the dark matter interacted with itself? And so there are theories where we have many Dr. Wimps, and they can run into each other and occasionally interact through something called an annihilation. So during an annihilation, the particles are completely destroyed, and all of their energy is used to create new particles. And so this is the time of the talk where I get to use the equation you all know. So we have E equals mc squared. Energy is proportional to mass. Therefore, if the dark matter particles have a lot of mass, when they annihilate, that means that there's a lot of energy in the annihilation. So you have a lot of m, therefore the annihilation is going to make stuff with a lot of e. And so from these annihilations, we expect there to be some photons or light particles created. And then since the dark matter is so massive, we expect those photons to be the highest energy form of photons that we know of, or something that we call gamma rays. And we already talked a little bit about gamma rays because that's what the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope sees. And just to give you an idea of how much energy is packed into a single photon at the gamma ray scale, a visible pho photon, so the, the light particles coming out of these lights here, hitting your eye, they have an energy of one electron volt. You don't need to know what that is. They, they have one. A gamma ray has a billion electron volts in just a single particle. So a single gamma ray particle is a billion times more energetic than a, than a visible photon. So these things are coming from some of the most extreme, awesome uh, processes in the universe. Thankfully, our sun is a pretty gamma ray quiet source. This is good news for us. Human bodies plus gamma rays don't get along. Uh, thankfully, our Earth, the atmosphere, shields us from gamma rays um, being produced by space. Uh, but these really are some of the, I think, some of the coolest uh, photons around. So what we can do is we can say, all right, well, I know, let's figure out where there's dark matter, and let's go and see if we see some gamma rays from the dark matter whacking into each other. And so to do that, we can say, all right, well, here's this galaxy. It's got this big cloud of dark matter. So what if the dark matter is whacking into each other and making these gamma rays, do I see these gamma rays with my detector? Now, in order to do this, we need to know where to look. So we need to know where the dark matter is. Now, I told you that dark matter doesn't emit or reflect light, but we can see it, sort of, through an effect called gravitational lensing. So remember, dark matter uh, has a big gravitational field, and that gravitational field will bend light. And so this is a simulation from Wikipedia where you are centered on a black hole, so another object with lots of gravity. And the black hole is moving, we're moving with it, and then there's this background galaxy. And you can see the light from the background galaxy is getting bent or lensed by the gravitational field of the black hole. And seeing events like this where you have a compact object and looking for a flickering or a distortion of the background light People did searches like this in the 90s, surveys like Eros, to look for, think, look for those machos. Remember those massive compact halo objects, just really compact dim guys? So we're not seeing them, but we know there's lots of mass there. So if it moved in front of a background galaxy, then we would see the light from that background galaxy flicker a little bit. And we didn't see very many of these microlensing events. And so that's why machos have fallen out of favor to be like the prime dark matter suspect. We looked for them. This was their signature, and we just didn't see enough. And so that's why most people today are talking about particles. So let's look at where the big clouds of particles are. Again, we can use lensing. So we have our big cloud of dark matter. And since it's really massive, Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that that is going to warp the fabric of space time. So this is just like putting a bowling ball on a trampoline. And since light has to travel along the fabric of space-time, that is its only option, the light will get bent as well because the road it's traveling on curves. And so we can see here, we've got this dark matter cloud from a galaxy cluster that's in between us 
and this background galaxy. And so the reason we know that that big cloud is there is because we can see the light getting bent. And so here's a very famous image of, a lens, of lensing, uh, Abel 2218. You can see these arcs of the background galaxies that are being lensed by the foreground galaxy cluster. And so we can use these lensing measurements to tell how much dark matter there is, which is super important in order to figure out how many gamma rays you expect. Because say you get 10 gamma rays per dark matter collision, well, you start to have 100 dark matter particles whipping around versus a million. You know, you're, if you have a million guys whipping around at the same volume, you would expect to get more collisions. Therefore, you would expect to get more gamma rays. And so it's very important to know how much dark matter is in the direction you're looking when you're doing these searches. So here is another very famous uh, galaxy cluster. Uh, this is actually two, called the Bullet Cluster. And you might have heard of this guy, and you probably haven't seen this image. This is just the optical image. And so we can take these galaxies. It's much less obvious than the previous one, but there is lensing going on here, around here and here, from the two galaxy clusters. And so we can look at the optical. We can look at the lensing in the optical uh, photons here. We can also look at x-rays. X-rays are going to show us where the gas is interacting. So when we do that, we see the x-rays coming from the middle here, and we see the dark matter, or the lensing, coming from the outside here. And so what we believe is happening is that two galaxy clusters merged in the plane of the sky. So at the time, the blue and the red, so the blue is the dark matter, the red is the normal matter. The blue and the red were mixed together, and then as they passed on through, the red interacted and got stuck in the middle, and the blue did not interact. Remember Ghost Ninja? And so it went right on through as if nothing happened. So let's watch that again, because I know I went over that a little quickly. So again, here, we have the red is the normal matter that's described by our standard model of particle physics. The blue is the dark matter. And as these two galaxy clusters merged, the normal matter starts interacting it's shining super bright in gamma, or I'm sorry, x-rays. But the dark matter just went, on through, went right on through as if nothing happened. And so what's really interesting about this system is before when we were talking about the dark matter halo, we were talking about the galaxy, the normal matter, residing within the halo. But here we see a clear separation between the dark matter component and the non-dark matter component. And that's because these two things have merged. And we see that the normal matter is interacted and the dark matter hasn't. So this is a very important piece of the puzzle. This confirms that the dark matter does not interact very often, uh, which I guess is, that's going to make it harder to see. Um, OK, so that's the bullet cluster. Now, we've, looked, we've talked about observations uh, to see where the dark matter is and how much. It's also super important to understand how galaxies evolve and how we expect the dark matter to form and evolve over um, large time scales. And so it's really important to simulate dark matter as well. And so this is an example of a simulation that was performed uh, here by scientists at SLAC in Stanford. And here we're seeing something like a, a galaxy cluster, like the one that our Milky Way resides in, forming over the age of the universe. So you can see that everything kind of starts all scattered apart, but then it starts to gravitationally attract in through these streams. And you can start to see that slowly but surely, the small pieces accumulate to make this larger galaxy cluster halo that we're going to have things like our Milky Way forming within. And what's interesting about this picture, I'm just going to stop it, is so here we have the dark matter halo. It kind of looks like our blue picture. So, you know, that's good. We always like when our simulations match our observations. And we can see that it seems to be peaked here in the center. But we can see that the cloud isn't perfectly smooth. It isn't perfectly uniform. There are little subclumps, or subhalos, sometimes we call them. So the cloud here is clumpy. We know that there are going to be, or we predict from these simulations, that there are going to be places where there is an overdensity or an extra amount of dark matter. And that's places where we would expect there to be a brighter gamma ray signal, because if there's more dark matter, there's a higher chance they're going to run into each other and make gamma rays. 
All right, so we know about these subclumps from our simulations. We also know about these subclumps from our observations. And we've already seen two of them, the large and the small Magellanic clouds. So these two small companion galaxies of the Milky Way are two clumps of dark matter within the big halo that the Milky Way galaxy resides in. And so that means that there's a bunch of dark matter holding these things together, and so we can look for gamma rays from them, and we do. Now, besides the large and small Magellanic cloud, there's a whole variety of other companion galaxies in the Milky Way halo. So here is an image made uh, by my colleague Alex Julika Wagner. This is our Milky Way, as you probably know it. Here is the big dark matter halo the Milky Way lives in. And ever since the uh, having very deep optical surveys, like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and also the recent survey, uh, the Dark Energy Survey, we're able to see these over densities of stars where we know there is a, a companion galaxy. And these are really dim objects. And so we have a bunch of these guys, they're called uh, dwarf galaxies, that exist within this halo. And the dimmest of them, we need the best telescopes to be able to find. Because these guys are dark. This is an example of one, Leo 4. Here's our optical picture. Doesn't really like, look like there's much there, huh? But we can look at the motion of the stars in this image and know that there's a big clump of dark matter right there holding everything together. And so the fact that this is so dark is why these objects are so interesting to me. Because it means there's a lot of dark matter there. So that's a great place to look for gamma rays. And if we saw gamma rays coming from these companion galaxies, that would be a smoking gun for dark matter. We would just be able to fly through the trial absolutely going to say we have discovered dark matter if we saw a strong signal coming from these objects. So OK, so game on for our game of Cosmic Clue. We've got our three different search strategies. Let's go. And since we live in an age of information, you all have probably heard about some of our progress as we've been playing. And so I have a couple newspaper clippings here that maybe you've seen over the years. Uh, dark matter tends to get good press coverage. And something I'll uh, notice, hint. Notice the word hint. Clue. Hint. Hint. The word hint means something very specific to a particle physicist. And there's a reason why that word is being used in these articles. Because so far, all we've ever really seen are hints. And I'm going to try to give you some intuition for that. Now, this one um, just came out in March. I feel like this one is a little overstretching. Uh, <laughs> have we finally found dark matter? Uh, gamma rays present in a mysterious dwarf galaxy. Uh, the answer, at least based on the result that this uh, article is talking about, is Probably not, or at least we cannot say for sure at this time. And I want to talk a little bit about the analysis of Reticulin 2. Uh, this is something I was on this paper that the Fermilat collaborations and the Dark Energy Survey collaborations uh, wrote together, uh, looking at a newly discovered companion galaxy where we expect there to be a lot of dark matter. So we were looking for gamma rays from this object. And so we can take the, so Fermi sees the entire sky. And we get this beautiful all-sky image of the gamma rays, where you can see the bright plane of our galaxy. You can see the veil of pulsar and crab and gaminga, beautiful things. But for reticulum 2, we're going to zoom into this seemingly boring patch right here. So when we zoom in, this is a map of the number of gamma rays that we see. The x is reticulum 2. And these crosses here are other known things that are not dark matter that are making gamma rays. So you can see that this X falls on top of one of these little red blobs. So yeah, we're seeing a handful of extra photons, you know, maybe 10 or 20, in this direction. And so the question is, are we starting to see dark matter? Have we finally found dark matter? That's the question. And that's the question that we ask ourselves every day, us, us dark matter hunters. And as physicists, we have a very uh, specific method to quantify the answer to that question. And that's something called statistical significance. So in this analysis, we found the statistical significance to be something like 2.4 sigma, just for that object. Now, 
So statistical significance, we're gonna go through a little bit of an exercise to try to give you an idea of how I think about that. So what you're doing is you're quantifying the chance that what you're seeing was just a blip. Just you know, some big piece of static from the background, not a real signal. And it's important to be able to tell the difference between starting to hear something real or just seeing a red herring. Because the sooner you can figure out that something you're looking at is not worth your time anymore, then the faster you can turn your attention to other clues and other leads to look for dark matter. But you don't want to be too cautious because you don't want to miss a potential discovery. So that's the game. And with dark matter, we haven't seen anything obvious yet. So everything is lying right on this boundary of did we see it, did we not see it? And so let's try to figure out what exactly three sigma means. So three sigma means that it was a 0.3% chance that it was just a background fluctuation. So that seems like it's a very small chance. And so to help you get an idea for what three sigma means, we're gonna play the physics lottery. Yay! It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> the dog says it's going to be fun. He looks trustworthy. And so to play this physics lottery, what we do is we're going to choose seven numbers between zero and nine, and we have to get seven in a row to win. That's the game. All right, so I picked the first seven digits of pi. That seemed appropriate. And let's play the physics lottery. Oh, man, all right, we got the first one. That's one in 10. Oh, we got the second one. That's one in 100. And here we got the third one. That's one in 1,000 to get those three numbers in a row. One in 1,000 is approximately equal to three sigma. And so if you were actually playing the lottery here at this point, you would sit up a little straighter, right? You'd put your phone down. You would start to pay attention to what these next four numbers are. You start to get excited. But how sure are you that we're going to get the next four? Are you going to go call your boss and quit your job? <laughs> no. And so that's exactly how I think about three sigma. It's, it's evidence. In particle physics, three sigma is our threshold for evidence. So it's something where we get kind of excited. We definitely keep paying attention, but we want to watch it grow to something we call five sigma. And that's our threshold for discovery. And five sigma will be getting all seven of those numbers right. So you might say, oh, three to five, that's not a big difference. In sigmas, it is. It's a huge difference, because five sigma is a 0.00001% chance of it being a fluctuation. And so go back, go back and read articles from when the Higgs was just a three sigma and see how people were talking about it, because that's an example of how it should work. You get this three sigma, people are cautious, right? They say, oh, we're starting to see this hint, keep paying attention, and they keep watching, and it slowly grows into a five sigma discovery, and that's when you crack open the champagne and people start getting Nobel Prizes. And so since we're living now in an age where you guys are all hearing about these three sigma detections, I just hope you can keep this in mind, that three sigmas are gonna come and they're gonna go. So I wouldn't uh, get too attached to any three sigma hint, but definitely keep paying attention, because they don't happen every day. All right, so the game is not over. We've been able to cross a couple of things off of our list. And we're going to make a guess. We're going to guess, is it a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle, in a dwarf galaxy like Reticulum 2, annihilating the gamma rays? All right, this is how you play Clue. You make a guess, and then someone tells you if you're wrong or not. We have made this guess. And in the Fermi-Lac collaboration, we have not seen gamma rays coming from dwarf galaxies. So we can set limits on what the dark matter cannot be. And so we set limits in this plane of the interaction versus the mass. So if it interacted a lot, we should have seen gamma rays from it, because Fermi's awesome. And so what this means is we've excluded everything above this black line. So Professor Plum here had a dark matter model that predicted about a TeV mass particle with a cross-section of 10 to the negative 22. We would come back to him and say, no, Professor Plum, your model is wrong. We would have seen it. Go back and give us another model. And what's amazing about these limits, and something that I'm just incredibly proud of the LAC team uh, for doing, is we're able to exclude these guys. So this dashed line is that interaction rate that's just right to give us the universe that we see. 
So that's that interaction rate where theory and observation came together to really motivate this hypothesis. Now, we don't know what mass along this line the dark matter is, but what the Fermi Lat team has been able to do is exclude natural WIMPs below 100 GeV. So we know it, has to, it cannot be any of these. And this was really the first, we were the first experiment to be able to start to exclude things along this line. And so this is great news. I know limits can be sad because you didn't see anything. Like, yes, that's disappointing. Everyone should be disappointed by that. But we have a consolation prize where we can add another cross-off to our game pad. And so that brings us one, one step closer to discovering what the actual dark matter is. And so we do have future things that are coming up to help give us new clues. We have new leads to follow up on. One of those is we're going to build an upgrade to the LUX detector I showed you earlier called LZ. And this is something that Slack physicists are working on building a prototype of uh, over in building 620 that's across the street from our gym. I uh, went, it's kind of cool. It's right next door to the uh, large, uh, the LSST clean room. So they're working on that really hard here. And then that's going to be able to sit and stake out the dark matter to unprecedented sensitivities. We also have the Large Hadron Collider has come back online. It's going to start smashing things together at even higher and higher energies. And we have Slack physicists who are working on a, a detector called Atlas. And also the theory that goes into predicting what we expect to see from these exotic things like dark matter uh, little, little particles. Additionally, we just keep finding more and more of these companion galaxies like Reticulum 2. So this is an example of three more using the Dark Energy Survey. The Dark Energy Survey is an experiment that many physicists at SLAC are working on. And together, the Fermi LAT physicists and the DES physicists are working together to try to identify gamma rays from these new targets. And so that's something that I'm working on. And so the game is not over. Right? We know dark matter has to be there. It's, it's a crucial part to creating the universe that we see and live in. And we've made some progress in figuring out what it's not. And we have some ideas for how to figure out or how to uh, push the, the sensitivity bounds deeper and start looking for uh, candidates that we haven't been able to look for before. And so anyway, the game is, is ongoing. And I think we've got a lot of exciting results ahead of us. And if any of this seems interesting to you in the audience, new players are always welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Andrea. We have time for questions. Uh, the people in the aisles are running microphones. So please wait until you get the microphone to ask your question. And I guess the first question is here. Uh, do we have any reason to believe that the uh, gravitational constant should be the same for dark matter as it is for ordinary matter? So there are people who, so we take and look at the, these gravitational uh, pieces of evidence and people say, well, the gravity that we understand here on Earth might be different on galactic scales. And so maybe, you know, here at Earth, yes, the gravitational constant is 32, you know, feet per second squared, but if we zoom all the way out on this galactic scale, perhaps it behaves differently. Uh, these are theories called MOND, uh, Modified Newtonian Dynamics. So Newtonian, that's the Newtonian gravity. And people hypothesize this as an explanation for the evidence we put forth for dark matter. And they say, we don't need dark matter. It's just our theory of gravity is not correct on galactic scales. Now, MOND uh, theorists have a hard time explaining the bullet cluster and the fact that we saw this separation of the dark matter and the normal matter as they passed on through. And I think that's one of the, yeah, that's one of the biggest things. But it is a theory that people do talk about. And so, yes, the, the idea that this, this gravitational evidence, there are people who are questioning it, which I think is a great avenue to go down. And so stay tuned. We're, we're still not sure. Hang on, it's actually pretty hard to hear you. Yeah, it's a big room. Yeah. Uh, do you expect the photon spectrum from the WIMP annihilations to be narrow, like when electron-electrons, positrons annihilate? Yeah, so 
when the dark, so the, when the dark matter annihilates uh, in a very special way directly into gamma rays, um, you would expect a narrow spectral feature. That was actually my PhD thesis, uh, was, was looking for lines. Uh, with the dark matter, it does not do that. So like, electrons can do that because they can um, go right into the light. So rem photons are light particles. So dark matter doesn't talk to light as much as electrons talk to light. So that, that process where the dark matter makes a line or a narrow feature doesn't happen very often with dark matter. It's a much broader spectral shape. So if you look at the number of photons as a function of energy, it's, it does peak and fall off. And so it does have a spectral shape that we can look for that's somewhat different than, depending on the model, than other things out in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, wh why, are, why are the xenon uh, tanks put underground? Yes, good question, because I did not answer that. Um, right now, we have things called cosmic rays whipping through us that are coming from space. So these are things like muons. And a muon can penetrate very deep. So a uh, muon could blast on through the shell of your detector and make it right into the xenon and whack the xenon and make a signal that looks maybe like dark matter. And so since the muon noise here on Earth, like on the ground level, is so loud, we need to go deep underground a mile or more where the rock is going to absorb all of those muons, or most of them, so that things get really, really quiet. And so that's why we have to go underground to shield from cosmic rays. Uh, I have a question. Why xenon instead of some other liquid? That is a great question. So, and people do talk about using other liquids. Uh, there are people who use sodium, um, Dama's experiment. But yes, and sodium iodide, thank you. Uh, but xenon is special because it's, it's a very heavy nucleus. So there's lots of neutrons and protons packed in there. And you expect the dark matter to also be very heavy. And so you think about it, if you've got two billiard balls, when they're the same, they scatter really big, right? But if you had a bowling ball, and like a ping pong ball, and you move the bowling ball in, it's just gonna go right on through, and the, you don't see any change to the bowling ball, right? It, but I guess you can look for the ping pong ball to scatter. But you really, you get the maximum scatter when the masses of the two balls are similar. And so a xenon atom's nucleus mass is roughly about the size of the dark matter particle we're looking for, uh, a WIMP. And also I think it's relatively uh, cheap and easy to get ish no <laughs> well it's, it's easier than, but, than helium but there's one more uh answer which is that xenon is a, a noble gas so when you mm. cool it it's still noble and therefore you can make it ultra pure so you can get rid of all those trace radioactive isotopes make a very very clean setup for the experiment it's a very special material so uh, we're, we're we're glad someone bought some for us yeah <laughs> So the question I had pertained to Einstein's attempts to find a unified field theory and how dark matter affected that because it was dark matter postulated at the time Einstein was working on his final theories before he passed or was this something that was discovered after his passing? So we had some evidence for dark matter back in the 1930s but it wasn't really clear at that time that we needed something new. And I believe, and I guess you can correct me if my history is wrong, but on Einstein's gravitational uh, relativity equations is sort of where he first hypothesized dark energy. Because uh, he, he wrote down the equations and he saw that the universe was moving and he thought the universe should just be staying still. It shouldn't be expanding or contracting. So he added in this piece called a cosmological constant into his equation, which ends up being uh, pretty close to what we believe dark energy is today. And so I guess at that time, although then he, when, uh, the, when Hubble discovered the universe was expanding, Einstein called that his biggest blunder, putting in this cosmological constant. So even though it was, th there was sort of some hints there, there was some evidence there, I don't think it was really known uh, throughout the community at the time that there was this dark component of the universe, both dark energy and dark matter. Uh, yeah, in the back. 
So I know the detection procedure for neutrinos is very similar. How exactly will dark matter behave differently? Or do we not know? In like the um, Large Hadron Collider experiments? Uh, more, more with the underground detectors. The underground detectors. So the neutrinos, I guess, uh, they're very light and the dark matter is very heavy, so they aren't really going to get a scatter as easily. But also, they're, so I do know that the d underground detectors, they keep pushing their sensitivities down further and further. And they're actually, a, in maybe two or three generations, they're going to turn into amazing neutrino detectors because they're going to get sensitive enough to be able to detect those particles. So right now, they're sensitive to these heavier dark matter particles, but if we don't see anything and we keep pushing deeper and deeper, we're going to start detecting neutrinos um, from the sun at lower energies and from space uh, at higher energies. Actually, Andrew, can yeah. I take Please. Into, I'm sorry. So you detect neutrinos in various different ways. One of the things a neutrino can do is that it can hit something and turn into a muon, and that's a charged particle. You can see the track. So nothing yeah, goes in and then there's a track. Okay, that's, that's easy. Well, it's not easy, but it's easier, than, easier the dark than dark matter. matter. Right, but the neutral current. Then you can look for neutrinos from the sun, and their energy is millions of electron volts. So when they strike something, at least it deposits a substantial amount of energy. A dark matter particle hitting a xenon nucleus, it's thousands of electron volts. So you have to be much more sensitive, and also the rates are much lower. So it's like all the tricks you learned with neutrinos have to be done over in spades to do these kind of experiments. And of course, new tricks invented. Thanks, uh, yeah. in, the, in the video that you showed, uh, there was structure forming uh, with the dark matter present and with stars and galaxies. Uh, what is known or guessed about before that time? That is, was there Dark, ma dark matter presumed to be there, structured somehow, and, and then that caused uh, the collapse of hydrogen molecular clouds and stars, or how, how's that envisioned? Yeah, so the oldest snapshot of the universe that we have is the cosmic microwave background, and that is showing us what the universe looked like just 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And so from that picture, maybe you've seen it, it's kind of green and blue, speckly plot. Uh, it's rather homogeneous. Uh, everything's, you know, there's really not that much structure. There's some speckles, but they all kind of look the same all across the sky. And so that's kind of telling you that in this early universe, there really wasn't this structure that we see today. And so then, yeah, looking at um, yeah, how the galaxies formed and how the dark matter interacted with the other uh, normal matter to create the universe we see today. Uh, that is something that people study. Unfortunately, that's not my area of expertise, um, but that was put into that simulation. And we can see, as we go deeper and deeper with our telescopes, we can see further and further in the past. So we can watch, or we can see what the galaxy systems looked like a long time ago, and watch how they evolve as we look closer and closer, and we can compare that to our simulations to see if our understanding of how the, the gas and the dark matter is evolving and forming matches with observation. That's true, yes. The, that green and uh, blue speckly plot does give us evidence of, of dark matter back in, back in the day. Um, that's much harder to explain. <laughs> oh, yes, please. So, um, in your model of the creation of the galaxy, um, it looked like there were filament-like structures. Yeah. And I've also read that if you look at a very large scale and look at galaxies, they seem to be strung along <laughs> uh, filament-like structures. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, I guess for me, that's just, it's a nice match between our simulations and our observations, which you alluded to. So yeah, the simulations, you saw them start to stream into these filaments. And when we look and we can map out all these galaxies, like from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and we can put those back to back, and you can't tell the difference between the data and the simulation. And so that's great. And so I know that there are people who are studying, like, what happens when you're looking along a void, as they're called, so the places in between the streams. Uh, what happens there? Is there a magnetic field there? Does the light, as it travels through the void, does anything uh, happen to it? Does it get scattered? Uh, this is sort of an open question 
uh, to look into that. But I guess for me, when I, when I see the streams, I just see that as a wonderful match of our simulation and, and experiment, or observation. <coughs> My question is, what did we have before the Big Bang? Did we have dark matter or uh, normal matter? You say before the Big Bang? So for me, before the Big Bang is a hard one to answer with our current uh, scientific evidence. Uh, I don't think that I don't think we've we can't we've never seen anything from before the Big Bang, uh, and so at that point it, it's speculative um, and it, it's not clear to me. At least at this time, there isn't. Uh, any uh, testable hypothesis to go after. And so f I guess for me as an as experimental scientist, I would kind of just skirt, the, skirt away from that by saying, well, there isn't, very, any, isn't any evidence or any um, hypothesis for me to go after, so I don't really speculate about that right now. Okay, my second question is, how come we don't have all dark matter? Right, how come we don't have all dark matter? And <laughs> And that, again, that's a very deep uh, philosophical question <laughs> that I think that for me, yeah, I guess I, I don't know why. Uh, you could go with the anthropic principle and say that we are living in the universe today because this is the universe that we can live in and that if there was, everything was just dark matter, we would not be here because we are not made of dark matter. Uh, and, but we cannot know that universe because we can't exist in it. Uh, I guess for me, I, I know the... Uh, the facts that the evidence are revealing to us about the nature of the universe, uh, the questions about why, I, I'm not sure if we can answer that uh, in a scientific way. Yeah. Um, oh. Yes, I'm curious about the, the bullet galaxies um, and sort of what you expect to happen in the future uh, since the dark matter is not interacting with, it, with any of the, the masses, they sort of drift away. Uh, what do you expect to see happen to those? So realistically, on our time scales that we live in, uh, I don't think the bullet cluster is going to change very much. Uh, <laughs> that, that merger, I forget exactly how long it took, but it was millions of years. Uh, and so, yeah, we took another snapshot of it just a few years down the road. I, I don't think it would change that much. Uh, let's see, so pretending that we can live forever and the sun won't explode and engulf the Earth. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I guess we're going to have those two go through, and they might even, because you saw in that simulation of the different dark matter clumps, they all kind of, like, they come in, and they gravitationally attract, and they kind of move around each other, and so maybe these two things would kind of start to orbit. I imagine the stuff in the middle, since it's uh, radiating, it's going to maybe disperse away. Uh, this is kind of me just, just guessing based on my intuition. Um, yeah, oh, that was helpful. Um. I was hoping not to be the one to have to ask that question, but since nobody else asked it, what do you think about this rumor that's going around that the dinosaurs, the, dis the <laughs> disappearance of the dinosaurs had something to do with dark matter? Right, so uh, what he's referring to is uh, a book out by Lisa Randall, a theoretical physicist at Harvard. I think she's speaking up in San Francisco this evening, so thank you for coming to my talk instead of hers. <laughs> Uh, I, <laughs> I hope it was good, interesting. Um, so her, her theory, um, and this paper actually came out in March 2014. So I remember when this came out. And I think uh, some of the first words of it is, so this is a paper uh, by theorists. And so a theoretical physicist and experimental physicist are somewhat different. Uh, the theorists, they live more in a speculative land. Experimentalists, we like testable hypotheses and really you know, strong statistical significance to tell if something is, is true or not. Uh, but it's great that we have the theorists because they think about things that no one's thought of before and scenarios that no one's thought of before, and that's how you get new innovative ideas. And then they can tell the experimentalists, hey, go look, go look for this thing. Or you get the experimentalists who are like, oh, that's weird in their experiment, and they can go to the theorists and say, hey, what's going on here? Any ideas? So they, they really do um, work together. So Lisa's theory is that uh, the dark matter distribution in the galaxy is actually forms a disk inside the cloud, and that as the Earth, or as the solar system's going around the galaxy, it's moving in and out of the disk. And so when it goes through the disk where there's a lot more dark matter, there's a ch higher chance that the dark matter is going to interact with things in our solar system like comets. And you just get a comet that's in a nice orbit and you just give it a small little kick and that can perturb it out of its orbit and maybe send it on a collision course to Earth. 
And so her theory was that as the Earth is sort of moving in and out of this, of this disk of dark matter, maybe that is causing periodic kicking out of comets towards, towards Earth. Um, I believe that's a, at least that's my understanding of the theory. So right now, at least I, I did read the paper this afternoon because I knew she was talking about it, and the statistical evidence for what she's su suggesting is very low, um, less than one sigma it looks like. So um, I find it to be interesting. I will agree that maybe it's marginally significant, but for me as a experimentalist, I, I would need a much higher significance. Um, also, I would be interested to see if there were any other testable hypotheses that came out of that theory. Um, because for me, that's, that's what it's all about. Let's take two <coughs> more questions. Okay. Sir. Oh, behind you? Or, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, um, on the video where there was the, was it some kind of mass it, bringing stuff to it going through a galaxy, mm -hmm. uh, after it went through, there was some kind of black whatever it was kind of going around it. Mm -hmm. What was that? Yeah, so have you seen the movie Interstellar? No. No? You should see it, it's really good. Um, <laughs> and the, the depiction of the black hole and the way that the black hole is bending the light around it is top notch, Kip Thorne worked on that. You know, so we, they had a theorist, he wrote a paper. And so what was happening is it's like, um, oh, if you get a lens, you can like line everything up just right so that you get a ring of light. Uh, and you can get that in space, it's called an Einstein ring. And so that was what happening, as the uh, black hole was moving in front of the background galaxy, you hit that point where it was lined up just right, where the background light was getting scattered into a ring. Uh, but a after it went through, there was some kind of, it was black, it wasn't, it wasn't Oh, I guess light. that, you know, maybe that was just the, the simulation's depiction of a black hole. Oh. Yeah. It's okay. I ponder about what empty space, you know, places in between galaxies, et cetera, uh, and, and in the halo, is the density of the dark matter fairly constant or is it clumpy? And what about, quotes, empty space? What happens where there aren't too many stars? Is there dark matter there? Uh, does it expand into uh, places where it isn't? Uh. Yeah, so when, you, right, when you're on the galactic scale, you get this kind of spherical halo. And when you zoom out, you remember those filaments? Uh, we had like the strings of dark matter. And where those filaments cross, where the strings cross, it's like a spider web. At the nodes is where you get galaxies and galaxy clusters forming. And so, right, when you have a spider web, if you zoom in on where the two threads are crossing, if you zoom in close enough, it can kind of look like a sphere. But then when you zoom out, you actually see that it's these filaments. And so that's the case with dark matter, is uh, when you zoom all the way out, yeah, you get, you get these filaments, these spider webs of, of the dark matter structure. Yeah. Well, Andrea, thank you very, very much. Thank you. So uh, Andrea will stay around for a while.